uh, all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here with Mary and Joni for the Merge program. And um, we've been doing a series this summer on uh, uh, listening and uh, been talking about uh, uh, nonviolent communication and, of course, miracles and just having a great time here. So I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Mary and Joni to pray us in and uh, to uh, say hello. Mary, you're on mute. There you go. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hi Joni. You want to pray us in? Sure. <clears throat> awesome. Um, I think I'm going to use the miracle worker prayer because I love it so much, if you don't mind. And if we could take a moment and take a big, deep breath in and get ourselves as present to this moment as we can. Today, we begin by tucking our chins and bowing our heads. And knowing that all that God is all there is and that we are one with it. We surrender all that we are to all God will have us be. We bow our heads, our hearts, our desires and agendas to God's will. We trust that God knows us and loves us as we make our way home to peace. We trust that we will see miracles where we once saw lack and limitations and that we will be assisted in solutions where we once saw dead ends. We commit to remembering that we are immersed in God's holy ecstasy and audaciousness where all things are possible, plentiful, and perfect. We give thanks for another day of miracles and miraculous encounters. And may we always remember that this grace is offered to us, not just for our own peace and joy, but so that we may be fearless extensions of God's love. I'd like to add the prayer of Jabez. Oh God, that you would bless each, and one, each one of us indeed and expand the Christ consciousness within each one of us. Let your hand be with me and all of us and keep me from fear that I may not cause pain. May peace, joy, abundance, and prosperity are all ours as blessed children of love. And together, let us say, so it is. And Amen. so it is. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Joni. What's new with you, Mary? You know what? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to how to resolve conflicts with Marshall Rosenberg and Jesus. Take it away, Lynn. Thanks so much for being here. All right. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, yeah, I, I, I found this one. Uh, it's a pretty, it's a real gem. And um, it's, you know, Marshall's talking to us about uh, the conflicts that we have in our regular daily life, but also he talks about conflicts that are going on in, um, in places in the world where there's some serious deadly conflict that is all, all worked out through practicing this incredible uh, nonviolent communication. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and let me, well, first, let me make sure that I put the thing in um first place in my there we go there we go so i'm going to share the screen and we will watch this uh um video uh, just uh uh something from a course of miracles there we go that we're working all right very good um uh that uh uh, Jesus says to us in the Course of Miracles, in the holy instant, there is no conflict of needs, for there is only one. For the holy instant reaches to eternity and to the mind of God, and it is only there love has meaning, and only there can it be understood. So the needs that we're perceiving, the needs that we're uh, thinking about, uh, with everyone that we get involved with in the world, uh, whether it's a, a, a teacher or a, a, a companion, a spouse, a friend, uh, a religious leader, a, 
a politician, you know, all these different people that we deal with in the world, whether we deal with them directly or um, through just looking at them and thinking about them. Um, when we come to recognize that there is only one need that we all share. And uh, if we can come to that with these people, uh, we can understand that uh, the only thing that they really need is love, of course, uh, but they don't know it. And so it's up to us to be the, the, uh, the holders of the light in any kind of situation where we're uh, connected with people that we're having conflict with. And so uh, uh, there are no bad guys. There are only people trying to meet their needs. And that I think is uh, so wonderful to know and understand. And so we're gonna listen to Marshall, hopefully. Open up this video, yeah. Maybe. Oh, did I not make it a link? I didn't make it a link, that's why. Let's see. Let's see. Thank you for adding that in there, Lynn. Go down a little further, Lynn. About four things down. See the word link. Keep going down, down, down. Oh, down. okay. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. So put that in. Just you can just hit it there. Is okay. it not doing it yet? Well, because I need I think I need to copy it. Yeah, just copy it and do it. And okay. Or okay, I'll do that. I think I already have it. Wait a wait a second. I know the better thing. <laughs> I know the easier thing to do is to go over to where I already have it open and uh, uh, put it in the share. All right, is that showing up now? Yes, perfect. That worked, whatever you did. Okay. Can't hear. Can you turn up the oh, volume? He stopped. Okay, yeah. There you go. Okay, Lynn, it's not we're not hearing it. It's not going through the the Okay. Um, okay. So when you share, you have to hit the optimize video and share sound, then hit it. Okay. All right. Well, when the connection is over. there, there you go. I think it's going to make it hard for people to give it to you. Got it. Good I job. I wanted to say that almost every time. So I had to take a deep breath and realize empathic connection before education. Now is not the time to educate that the way you're asking for, it's going to make it pretty hard for somebody without super powered giraffe ears to hear your needs. Question on that. Doesn't doesn't the situation require some kind of resolution or solution yes, or yes, uh, and almost yes. and the resolution, that. the solution will find us when the connection is there. Now what connection? You see. Here's your wife's needs. Here's your needs. When she hears your needs without hearing any criticism or demand, and you hear her needs without any criticism and demand, the solution will find you. The conflict will resolve itself. It does need to be resolved. But what most of us do, we skip this and go right to here. For example, I sometimes do uh, workshops just with uh, married couples 
or other people living together in a love relationship. And what we do to begin the workshop, we identify the couple who has had a conflict, the longest outstanding conflict that could not be resolved. <laughs> and I make a prediction, and it's right, my prediction has been accurate in, in maybe, I'm sure, at least 75% of the cases. But my prediction is this, that we will resolve the conflict within 20 minutes within 20 minutes from the point at which both parties can tell me what the other party is needing. Okay? Now, one time we found a couple married 39 years. 39 years had a conflict, had not been able to resolve this conflict. The wife said to me, Marshall, I can tell you right now, we're not going to be able to resolve this within 20 minutes. We have a good marriage, we communicate well, uh, but this is just one of those things that we're different people and we just have a conflict here. And I said, let me correct one thing. I didn't say we're going to resolve it within 20 minutes. I said within 20 minutes from the point at which you can both tell me what the other party is needing. Oh, she said, Marshall, when you've been married 39 years and you've talked about something almost every day, I can tell you, uh, we understand each other. The problem isn't that. We're just two different people in this issue. Well, I said, I've been wrong before. I can sure be wrong this time, but let's see. We'll find out within 20 minutes. So first, tell me what his needs are in this situation. He doesn't want me to spend any money. He responds immediately, that's ridiculous. <laughs> 39 years of communication. Now, first of all, doesn't want me to spend any money is not a need. See, needs and strategies need to be separated. They had been talking about how much money she could spend and not spend, and, but the more important issue there was whether, see, whether who takes care of the checkbook. He unilaterally controlled the checkbook, which was really the main issue between them. See, but that's, I'm saying I don't even want the couple to talk about the strategies or the solutions until the connection is there. When the connection is there, the conflicts usually resolve themselves. So I pointed out to her, no, that's not a need. And even if it was, notice he's saying that's not accurate. Well, she said, okay, let me then tell you what his needs are, Marshall. You see, he's just like his own father. They both have a depression mentality when it comes to money. I oh, said, stop, stop. <laughs> now I'm hearing psychoanalytic jackal. You're, you're, <laughs> You know, and I was going to take another 39 years if you get into that. No, I'm not asking for an analysis of his personality. I'm saying, what are his needs? She didn't know. After 39 years, she had no awareness, consciousness of his needs. So I said to him, okay, well, she doesn't uh, know. Why don't you tell her? Marshall. Well, Marshall, uh, let me tell you what her needs are. You see, she's a lovely woman, lovely woman, wonderful mother, a wonderful wife. But when it comes to money, she's totally irresponsible. Here comes another 39 years, you see. <laughs> I ask for a need and he gives me a diagnosis. And of course, she immediately says, that's unfair. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. So I could see they didn't have a need literacy, so I had to loan them my ears. So. With giraffe ears, of course, I'm conscious that all judgments, she's totally irresponsible, is a tragic expression of an unmet need. You see? So if she would have had these ears, they would have been able to resolve this in the first year of their marriage. But she didn't. She was taking it personally. So I helped them out. I said, when you say she's irresponsible, are you feeling frightened and need to be sure the family is protected economically? He said, that's exactly what I mean. Well. That wasn't what he had been saying for 39 years. But he didn't know how to say his feelings and needs. Okay, so I've got his needs identified. He was scared, wanted to protect the family economically. I turned to his wife and said, could you tell me back what you heard him say? But because I did, you know, one time I overdrew the checkbook when we were, you know, first married. Now he thinks, I said, excuse me, excuse me. Notice what the first word that she said was, but. See, she doesn't know the cardinal giraffe rule. 
Never put your butt in the face of an angry person. <laughs> I said, what are his feelings and needs? But, no, 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 no. What are his feelings and needs? Want me to repeat them? Yeah. I hear him saying he's scared. Well, but, no, hold it, hold it, hold it. Calm down, calm down. <laughs> Hear his feelings and needs. See, but after 39 years of enemy image, it's not easy for somebody to shift these images. You see. Once we get one of these images in our mind of the other person's wrongness, even when they are expressing their needs, we don't hear it. These enemy images are hard to get past, you see. So she's been seeing him as cheap and having this depression mentality for 39 years. See? So she can't see the human being behind her image. I said, let me repeat it again. I hear him saying he's scared because he needs some to protect the fa and needs to protect the family economically. Can you say back? Yeah, he thinks I'm irresponsible. Let's try it again. After three more re repetitions, finally, she could hear his needs and feelings separate from her judgments. Finally. Yes. Did you try to um, empathize with her at any point? Or did you just keep repeating his need and try to get her to Yes. Uh, after I had tried twice to get her to hear it, I could see she was in too much pain to hear him. So I had to do what I was just demonstrating like this. Actually, I had needed to give her some emergency first aid empathy. So you, you did do that before I could pull her by the ears to get her to hear him. So if after I try two times to pull the jackal by the ears, it's hard to do that because he keep trying to bite, you know, then, uh, then I back off. So it really hurts when you hear criticism. Yes, yes, I mean, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and so you really need to be trusted. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now I'd like to repeat what he said, and I'd like to have you tell me back what he said. So yeah, I did have to do a little bit of cleaning up the mess before I could. See, every image that she's heard in the past, every criticism, which she'd heard for years she was irresponsible, now it's hard for her to hear the need that was being expressed all along behind that. So finally I get her to hear his feelings and needs. Okay, we're halfway through. Now this much took me an hour. Okay, now I try to help her. So could you tell me now what your needs are? Well, just because I made them, you know, I overdrew the checkbook, you know, before, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to do it again. He said, yes, but we could be out of money, but excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <sighs> so, you're really frustrated, and if I hear you correctly, you have a need for some trust that you can learn how to handle money. Yes. Husband, could you tell me back? Yeah, and we'll be out of money by then. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> Can you tell me what her feelings and needs are? Would you like me to repeat it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> About three more repetitions. He hears her. It didn't take 20 minutes to resolve it at that point, you see. Whenever I go into situations where there's been a lot of conflict. I don't even allow the people to talk about strategies until they're connected at the heart level. I was working with two tribes in northern Nigeria, one Christian tribe and one Muslim tribe. One quarter of the population killed in one year. One out of four people killed. It took my colleague six months to get them to agree to come into a room together. During that six months, 60 people killed. So by the time it took us to get everybody into a room together, 60 people killed. So now it's not a husband and wife I have on opposite ends of the table, but the chiefs of two tribes. I start the same way I did with the husband and wife. Uh, I'd like to hear you express your needs. What needs are not being met? I'm pretty much guessing ahead of time I'm not going to get an answer to my question. Because if people had been communicating at the need level, there wouldn't have been a hundred people dead. So I wasn't surprised when instead of getting an answer to my question, I got this back. These people are murderers! Well, you've been trying to dominate us! See, I ask for needs, I get back 
diagnoses. So just as with the husband and wife, I put my ears on and translate each statement into a need, get the other side to hear it. It wasn't easy. I had to do a lot of first aid empathy to get, because like when I got this person behind murderers was, so you are frightened of any use of violence to resolve conflict and want some agreement to resolve it in some other way? Yes, exactly. Okay. Could you say back what you heard? Then why did you kill my child? So it wasn't too easy. But anyway, after about, it took about an hour again for me to get one need expressed, one need heard, one need expressed, one need heard. And one of the chiefs who hadn't spoken yet said to me, if we know how to communicate this way, we won't have to kill each other. See, it just took one hour to see that if they can just stay connected at the heart level, nobody has to die. There's plenty of resources for getting everybody's needs met. But we lose that when we get up into our head and start to analyze wrongness. All right, I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed that and uh, uh, <laughs> got, got a, um, a pretty good idea of how, even if people have a long time conflict or any conflict at all, it doesn't matter what the conflict is. When we get to the point of looking and recognizing our needs and our brother's needs, we have a, a place to go. And that connection will bring about the, the peace and the change that we've been looking for and um so i had a couple of uh first off any anybody have any thoughts about what we just watched and what we just heard well it, it, it sort of reminds me lynn of the course of miracles when we clog up the channel of peace uh with accusations judgments um blame guilt we can't get the flow or in this case listen for the solutions because we're we're just keep mucking it's like just keep clogging it up it puts a barrier between solutions or understanding or listening if we can continually um blame judge and make excuses of all kinds so i to see it in real time the difference was that shift where taking ownership of doing that allows it no longer to be blocking the communication, the solutions, the good, the uh, connection. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get an A. Okay, good. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, oh, and, and, and can you see how um, helpful that can be in like any current situation that you happen to be in and we're going to take some time to practice um uh and of course if you have you know whatever kind of conflict you know it doesn't have to be uh like a big beef that you're having right now uh it, with anybody or anything just you know come up you know look at at um the conflicts that you have and, uh, you know, we can, you know, maybe pull up some that we can look at and discuss, you know, why am I having this? <laughs> why, why, why does this continue? Um, because, as he said, um, there comes a point where you're no longer seeing the person, you're just seeing the villain, you're just seeing the bad guy. And you become so habituated to seeing that person as being the bad guy that you can't open yourself to look at them and look for their needs. But, you know, as we were talking earlier uh, before we started, um, you know, there are people in like political people that we can all agree or disagree with, whatever we choose, uh, but that we look at and we see as being villains. And if we could actually look at them and see them as uh, the the see them that that they're needing what they're needing uh, that they're missing that they don't have that um, the the what what they don't experience in their lives 
that would give them peace, um, you know, it's, it's no wonder they're so unhappy. And so <laughs> wanting to make everybody else unhappy, uh, there's a lot of people who just want to piss people off because they're so angry. And it causes so much heartache in the world. What were well, you going to say? Our ego takes the bait of that. The minute, the minute we get defensive or judgmental back or reactionary and don't take the time to get to peace or silence or stillness, then, you know, we're taking the bait. So when one throws out the mud slinging or the judgments, whatever, and the other one um, takes that personally or um, judgmentally or whatever, then the, you got two battling egos instead of of any option for light of God or Holy Spirit to, to come in and do the work. So, I mean, in here, it's, it's just to be able to hear the other person. So communication and connection can open and solutions can rise as people calm down their, their um, ego, negative judgments and reactions, maybe. No, that's true. <laughs> There's no maybe about that. I, I mean, I, that, uh, it works that way. <laughs> I did that. I loved my training in the 90s of um, before lawyers got a hold of it, they, they uh, invited us to take uh, mediation training. And we did it in the courts where landlords and some, some uh, custody kinds of things, just not, it really wasn't that uh, serious. It was, it was supposed to be a lot of landlord things, a lot of neighbor conflicts, simple things about parenting, not, act, I didn't mean custody, it looks like teenager problems, you know. The judges wanted help to lessen the case because they only have a mindset of reactionary and then they make a 50-50 version of the answer. But by learning the slowing down and all the techniques in that and filling out the paperwork and having um, caucuses and, and listening to both sides, it was an interesting uh, way of, of helping people. But really, it was ultimately just slowing down and trying to get them to like he was using with puppets. I mean, we did it very formally, but and with writing, but really it was, it sounds a lot like what he's doing with puppets, you know, getting people to face each other, to be, follow some decorum and not, you know, attack and listen. And it was very valuable. And yeah, it is very valuable. And to, I mean, what, what he's obviously is using the puppets to show you this is the ego mind thinking, this is the Holy Spirit mind thinking, this is, and, and, and giving us a real, um, you know, kind of making it graphic. Um, and uh, of course, I feel bad for jackals because they're not that bad of creatures, <laughs> but it's okay because it's a common terminology and something that we agree you know, not we agree, but it tends to, uh, you know, be seen as, you know, they're, they are, uh, they're ego based creatures. So, uh, but, but, but yeah, it's really learning how to think with the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to tell us, inform us. And that's why it's not always good to, you know, try to come up with a solution. You know, when he talks about strategies and solutions, those are things that come up after you have come to a complete place where you can have a harmonic relationship um, and you can be in the holy instant with a person. Whereas, you know, if you're still in conflict, uh, you're, the, what the ego wants to do is solve the problem now. Let's just stop talking about it now. I don't want to hear about it anymore. So um, I'll just say yes to you or, you know, you'll just back off or I'll just back off. But we never actually come to the resolution of the conflict because we haven't really looked at what the needs are that are not being met. So we walk away, both of us still hungry, still, still starving because we haven't, um, we haven't uh, really looked at what was the cause of the conflict. And uh, anybody else have anything they'd like to share? And I'm going to put the... Um, um, 
Well, Lynn, I have something you said that rather quickly. We haven't looked at the cause of the conflict. Um, that can be kind of nebulous. We both in a conflict feel like we know the cause, but I think what is underneath that and what Marshall was saying is that we need to look at what the need is of the other person. Yes, correct. So it's a little more specific. And then, like you just said, which is, you know, now you're bringing A Course of Miracles into it. Ask the Holy Spirit for help in listening to the other person. Maybe ask the Holy Spirit. We have this list of seven needs from Marshall Rosenberg. What, what is the need or can I surmise the need of the other person? Well, yeah, and you can ask and the to, other person their need. Yeah, it's just we, at, over the last seven months, we've had this list of needs. And I know I've been working with it pretty regularly. But I don't think that other people really know what their needs are. Yeah, no, that's and and you could tell that because the 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 conversation he was having about the couple, you know, they didn't. She didn't know what her need was. She just felt attacked. He didn't know what his need was. He couldn't say that what I really need here. He was in so much fear. He hadn't even really looked at it. What was it that he really needed or what was it that she really needed? So, um, so it is actually being able to, you know, stop and step back and look at what are these needs. Um, and of course the needs are being expressed by the feelings. The feelings are the things that tell us, you know, something's wrong and it's in this direction. And then we can look at the needs and see uh, what, where, where we're missing something, where something isn't, isn't here for us that we, that we uh, think we need. So like for that, I'm, I just put up the, the kind of the needs list. And, uh, you know, I could see that the, the woman, um, she needed a sense of autonomy and freedom and independence. Uh, she wanted to feel trusted. She, she, she you know, there, there, she had a bunch of needs that he was not even aware of. And he had a need to feel uh, safe and secure financially and that he could trust her. He needed to feel like he could trust her too. And neither one of them had ever expressed that or even knew that that was the situation. And so until they came to the place where they saw, oh, this is what he really needs. I mean, this really helped me a lot in my relationship uh, with my husband because you know, I used to just think, you know, he's just being a jerk. He's trying to be controlling. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't understand me and how I'm a, you know, freedom loving, you know, I want to do what I want to do kind of person. And so we had a lot of conflicts, but what I really began, began to realize was that what he needed, he needed to feel secure. He needed to have a, 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 experience where uh, he didn't have to worry about what was going to happen. And he was worried all the time. So, uh, and a lot of it was because he didn't understand what I was doing or why I was doing the things I was doing. Uh, you know, he, it, it didn't, he didn't understand what, you know, why I needed what I needed to. <laughs> Um, but when we came to understand, when we came to understand each other's needs, then I recognized, oh, I'm making him feel really, uh, really insecure when I'm, you know, going off and buying this or doing that or setting this up or, you know, joining this or going here or there. You know, I, I you know, I, he spent a lot of time in fear because he had originally PTSD from having you know, whole life of not being able to trust people. <laughs> so, you know, and for me, it was like, you know, why don't you trust me? Don't you know, I'm only doing the best thing. So, you know, once I recognized that that was what he was feeling, that the feelings of, of uh, uh, insecurity and fear uh, for the future and, and uh, 
uh, distrust, all those different things, then I knew how to address that because then I would explain and show them, oh, here, here's what's going to happen here. And here's why this is this way. And, you know, help him understand why I was doing what I was doing. And he became much more trusted. He trusts me now for everything. There's not a thing. I mean, nothing, you know, if I said to him, you know, we're going to sell this house and move to, you know, Kentucky, he'd be like, okay, because he knows that I know what he needs and I'm going to take do everything I can to make sure that he doesn't have to worry or be afraid. Um, you know, it that's a great, that that's a me. great, that's a great example, uh, Lynn. It'd be great if we could get to an actual conflict. So you sure. have two more, see, so it's 10 after and you have two more paragraphs here. Do you want me to read the first one? Sure, that would be great. Okay, so we're in A Course in Miracles, text chapter one, and it says, a sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. I'll read that again. A sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. This sense of separation would never have arisen if you had not distorted your perception of truth and had thus perceived yourself as lacking. We'll just remember that in our ego self, we're perceiving uh, what's going on in the world and within our own self and perception is projection. So we're projecting our unmet needs onto the other people and our feelings about things onto other people. The things that we don't want to, that we're just not able, we don't have the bandwidth to see them at the moment. So we want to get rid of them, put them outside of ourselves. The idea of order of needs arose because having made this fundamental error of distorting what's the truth, you had already fragmented yourself into levels with different needs. As you integrate, you become one and your needs become one accordingly. Unified needs lead to unified action because this produces a lack of conflict. And that's from A Course in Miracles, the text, chapter one, section six, paragraph two. That's a lot right there, but it's basically just telling us we really have only one lack uh, to correct. And that is this sense within ourselves that we are separate from God. We really are not. God has never left us. We are still in the mind of God, a thought of God, capital T, but it's our ego self that goes off and uh, gets scared and um, fragments itself. And um, yeah, so um, there's another uh, paragraph. Does anybody want, Lynn or Joni, do you wanna say anything about that paragraph? Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of reinforce that, that what Jesus is saying is that as we become, as I become less conflicted, it actually straightens out conflicts uh, throughout because, you know, I have recognized that what you really need and what I really need are the same thing, uh, whether it's the need of the, uh, uh, okay, whether it's the need of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Holy Spirit to, to be uh, connected to God, or it's a need to make sure that I have a place to live tomorrow. You know, <laughs> um, even though I have a place to live, doesn't really you know, bring me any closer to God or remind me of my connection to God. It certainly is easier to remember when I'm not worried about my future. So, you know, that's, that's why you can't, as, as a student of Course in Miracles, you can't just say, well, I only need God, so I'm not going to do anything uh, to help my life out or take care of myself, uh, because we do have a conflict. We don't recognize that for real. If we did, 
you know, that we wouldn't be here talking about this this way. Um, or maybe we would, I don't know. But, uh, you know, we're, we're working now to, to recognize the source of the conf conflict and to get there uh, to the place where it no longer exists. And that only comes from uh, being willing. Uh, so yeah, Joni, you want to read this paragraph? Or anything else to say? I'm sorry. No, I'll, I'll read. The first corrective step in undoing the error is to know first that the conflict is an expression of fear. Say to yourself that you must somehow have chosen not to love or fear could not have arisen. Then the whole process of correction becomes nothing more than a series of pragmatic steps in the larger process of accepting the atonement for this remedy. These steps may be summarized in this way. Know first that this is fear. Fear arises from lack of love. The only remedy of, for lack of love is perfect love. Perfect love is the atonement or forgiveness, correct? Yes. Correct, yes. Well, there's the formula. I'll write that recipe down again. It's not like I haven't heard it 10 times a day, but hey, I'll write it down again. Any comments about that? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm sure you probably have some too. It, it really is just right away, whenever you have an issue or conflict that comes up, just say, this is fear. And it's arising from a lack of love. And look at... Um, he says, say to yourself that you must have somehow chosen not to love or the fear would, could not have arisen. So when he's saying not to love, actually he's saying to judge, to, to, to um, look and to judge against or uh, to say no or whatever. So that forgiveness that comes from uh, acceptance of whatever the situation is and loving the situation, loving the person, loving the, the you know, whatever, whatever is happening, um, that really is, that is what really is gonna bring you out of the fear. So um, <clears throat> that, that whole idea of just recognizing, okay, this is fear and it's because I have reacted with a lack of love to one of God's creations, as he tells us in chapter five in the decision for God. And, you know, you can look at, you know, what, what, what lack of love, you don't have to kick yourself for it. You just have to remember that love is the only answer. So the only remedy for lack of love is perfect love. And perfect love is the atonement, is the correction, is forgiveness. It's, it's the return to peace. Um, so yeah. it, the answer is love. <laughs> Can you um, tie this in uh, with um, nonviolent communication and Marshall? Can you, because this, it, it, I feel like it, it could help me more if, know that this is fear. So knowing what the um, need is and that as that need arises from fear or lack of love or lack of needs being met, the only remedy is, really is to give that perfect oneness or that perfect acceptance, that perfect love. And the only um, perfect love is through forgiveness that I, th that I thought anything had gone wrong here. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what it is. You Another know, star. The, the situation with the, the couple or the situation with the tribe, tribes people, you know, the whole idea is, you know, if I love you, I want your needs to be met. <laughs> I want you to have what you need. I accept what you need. I I could help you if that's what you need. Um, I I'm not going to judge you. you. I'm not. I acknowledge. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to make you feel guilty for what you need. I'm just. It's all perfect. And I can do that calmly and know what the specific words and actions are because when I'm in that oneness, 
then flows God and, and Holy Spirit through that channel. Remind me in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why Marshall, when he put up the two hearts and said, you know, the solution is down here, but you're not going to come to it until you actually have come to knowing uh, and, and, and understanding the other person's needs. We can only do that in peace and stillness. Yeah, yeah I, have a, I have a question about that. Remember when he said, okay, he wrote the two, he drew the two hearts. When we hear each other's needs without any blank and demands, do you remember the word that he used there? Hmm. I don't, I'll have but, to, I'll have uh, to but go it's back. all strategies, uh, strategies well, or solutions. What occurs? Or what um, I, I know what the word is. It is um, uh, uh, what do you call it when you when you think you know what another person is thinking? Um, assumption. No, um, it wasn't. As, the word is not assumption, but it, it'll come to me anyway. Go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, yes. So I hear that it is important that we kind of help identify even in our own mind what the other person is needing. And we can ask outright, what is it that you really need here? Um, and I'm thinking of a situation that I'm in a conflict in my own mind right now. Somebody asked me to do something. And and she actually asked me, take this to the Holy Spirit, if you could, and think about this. And so I went off and made judgments about something else. And I, I'm only able to identify it because following this little corrective step paragraph from chapter two, I see that I'm not being loving because what's the opposite of love is, is judgment or not the opposite of love is fear. And underneath that fear is a judgment. Yeah. And um, so I'm seeing that I'm, I'm judging. I'm not bringing love to the situation. Okay, so I identify that. Um, in the early days of going through the Course of Miracles, I might have said, yeah, I don't, I'm not bringing love to the situation because I'm not feeling loving within my own self. I don't have that love to bring to the situation. So that's when the only remedy for a lack of love is perfect love. And where can I go to get that? It's my connection with the Holy Spirit is to ask as best I can at the moment for help from the Holy Spirit, for love from the Holy Spirit in this situation. So that's one thing that I see might be helpful in um, following this uh, prescriptive prescription and then and then Joni asked how does this tie into nonviolent communication I can start to see I can look at the needs list and and start to identify what's the need of this other person perhaps because I really don't know for sure but I but I do know in the sense that the only need we all have is a connection with our divine is to is is to have that oneness with with God, and that when we don't have that, we're scared, and that indicates an unmet need inside that really just covers is a cover up for the real true need, and that's feeling a disconnect from God. Beautiful. That's a beautiful way to put that. And uh, yeah, the, the word was diagnosis without diagnosis or demands. Okay. Thank you. So, so when we, if, 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 when we recognize that. It's, so you figured that out while I was talking, huh? Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because, because what you were talking ah, about, I was like, Oh yeah, because you're not diagnosing the person. You're not diagnosing what is wrong with them or what their problem is. All you're looking at is what might they be needing and you know as bottom line it's always love it's always connection it's always the holy spirit but it may be represented to people by uh you know my whatever my financial well-being or because a lot of people don't you know aren't going to say oh i think it's the holy spirit i'm missing god uh, but they are going to say you know i think i'm I'm lacking in some way or the other. And, uh, you know, we don't have to even acknowledge 
that that's the real problem with them uh, to them uh, because you know it comes it, the problem the solution comes and that's what you have to understand and that's I think what Marshall was indicating it isn't because um, you have figured out the right answer is because you've like stepped back and recognized that we all equally have the same needs and so uh, I can let the Holy Spirit bring the solution, whatever that may be. Uh, it's it's always there and it's perfect. And uh, beautiful. Thanks, you guys. So we have about five minutes. Do we have a conflict from anybody's life? Maybe something kind of simple that we could put into our prescription, our recipe. Go ahead, Mary. Would you would you share one, please? Um, if you if you don't so be on the con, So a conflict, a conflict. Um, uh, okay, I have one that. Okay, I'll just say. Um, it's, so I have three roommates in this house, three housemates, and um, one uh, doesn't, we share uh, silverware and knives and we share our kitchen utensils. And one, um, so when I, when I first, when I, when one roommate moved in, I bought a bunch of sponges and I had some, I had a bunch. So I said, hey, you can have this one. He's like, okay. So um, when he washes the silverware, I feel like it's still really greasy and not clean. And I see he still has the same sponge, like kind of tucked in a corner that uh, I gave him two months ago now, three months ago. Um, I tend to change my sponges regularly and I kind of like, I use the kitchen a lot. And so I, I thought that I was thinking of a way to tell him, or I'm going to go out and get some new sponges and say, hey, I have another sponge. And then he'll at least have a clean sponge to watch, wash the dishes. But um, I've had this before with, with another roommate where, you know, if we don't have a dishwasher, you're left to your own devices about how to clean silverware and uh yeah so it's it's a little conflict that i feel but i also kind of feel like i have the the answer and that's to get some new sponges and offer him a sponge well i'll just throw that out so um so the question i guess is is it the sponge that's causing the the conflict uh, that he's using a sponge that's dirty or it's, that he's not cleaning the silverware um, to the state that makes you feel comfortable. Um, it's, it's really about the, the cleanliness of the silverware. And because it's really about my feelings about picking up a piece of silverware and having it be greasy. And then I use my time to reclean it. It's my judgment about the dirtiness of the silverware. Well, I, 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 you say it's your judgment about the dirtiness of the silverware, but I don't think there are many people who would disagree with you that um, you know, dirty silverware is not what I want to use when I'm eating. So you know, the conflict is, is you know, in the, maybe the difference between, you know, what you perceive as being acceptable and what he perceives as being acceptable. And so, you know, the conflict, I think, is more in terms of, you know, what he thinks, what he needs, <laughs> he needs to get them done quickly or something and, or wh whatever his, I don't know what his reason is and you need for them to be clean. So your needs are conflicting. So this is where, um, if he understood your need and you understood his need, then maybe the solution would come very quickly 
because I don't think he wants to gross you out with dirty silverware. And I don't think you want to accuse him of being negligent for not cleaning the silverware. So you really do have to have a conversation <laughs> with it if, it, if, if, if there's a conflict that needs to be done taken care of because he won't get the hint don't don't this is not a kind thing and i'm you know i'm just uh, in general to give people hints about things is not helpful mm -hmm. because it just comes off as um you know whatever he may think you know he may think oh she doesn't like the way i clean the silverware so she's giving me another sponge or he may think hey here's another sponge thanks yeah. Uh, and, and I don't never have to clean go out and get one. Yeah, <laughs> I think we both. I think we both have a need for clean dishes. I don't yes. doubt that. I don't doubt um, that. And um, I think, as you're talking, and I appreciate it, you're kind of teasing it out. I think this is an opportunity to, to use the um, the the four sentence request. Um, the request offer, uh, and yeah. to put it through that and the offer, right? So yes. um, we are at 27, so we're going to close out and not every conflict needs to be resolved right away, but I can also just say that thank you for letting me bring it up and because every time I see it, I just think I need to talk to Lynn about going through the offner or just take it myself, you know, but it just would be a little more fun to take it because it's not that big of a deal. It's not driving me crazy. It's just, it, it, you know, an opportunity to utilize the request. That's what I would yeah, say. And I, it's better that you get a chance to practice this when it's less charged, don't you think? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Perfect. So yeah, I just I just love this. How to resolve conflicts with Marshall Rosenberg and Jesus. Maybe we could continue this next week. I, I would love to do that. And uh, yeah, I was Thank just you. You know, thinking, you know, what, because what if you got sick? What if you got some kind of bacterial or something, in, intestinal thing? And what would be the first thing you thought? You know, oh, it's his, he didn't clean the, the fork the way I needed or well, whatever. Because so, I do re reclean them. I yeah. do, re I, if it's yeah. greasy and, and, but maybe there's some that I don't even notice. So I probably wouldn't go to that place. I don't think I just, you never know. Kind of, I just kind of have a, a I, I have a need for clean dishes. I just, I'm just, that, that's me, but we do have one minute left. Would anyone like to call, pray us out? Sure. I will pray us out. <laughs> thank Perfect. you. So and much. thank you so much, Lynn. This was a great film. Great. Just great. Great stuff as we continue our ACIM and nonviolent communication. Thank you. Well, and thank, thank you to you, you, Joni. This is perfect. It is beautiful. So, so let's just take a moment, take a deep breath, and think about those that we love and want to share this great principles with. Um, how much happier our lives are going to be as we. Uh, continue to be able to resolve our conflicts and see the peace, see the truth, and to recognize that the real need that we all have is to be loved and to love and to know God. That is really all we need. And as we go through these classes, as we go through these practices, as we work with our own thinking with the Holy Spirit, um, we begin to see such a beautiful results. And I'm so very grateful for the ability to do this. I'm so very grateful for the time and the willingness and the love that everyone who comes to this class brings. I'm grateful to you, Mary and Joni. I'm grateful to anyone who may be listening who might want to change their life by thinking about other people's needs in a more uh, uh, um, willing fashion. I'm grateful for everyone who joins with me in this acceptance of the atonement of the Holy Spirit, of God, of love, of reality. And uh, I can just say, amen. Amen, you guys. Thank you. Amen. And so it is. Thanks. Thanks, Joni. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to next week. All right. Bye. Thanks, Mary. Bye.